Hi, and welcome back to Leslie's Lab. In this episode, I'm going to tear down a CO2 laser marking head that I've picked up. So let's stick this on the bench and take a look. So I picked up this rather large and very heavy carbon dioxide laser off of eBay. This is actually a, a CO2 laser printer. It's a, it's a marking machine. And this was used for etching barcodes and date codes and all those kind of things onto products. The rated output power is 20 watts at a quite a peculiar wavelength of 9.3 microns as opposed to the usual 10.6. Uh, the reason for this is various plastics um, behave better or are easier to be scribed depending on the sort of wavelength they're using. My suspicion is that this is completely unserviceable, but I'm just interested in this for the optics that I can get out of the resonator. And more interestingly than that, it's got a scan head as well, which seems to be complete. So basically I bought this for a tear down and to harvest for parts. So let's dive right in and take a look. Before I finally crack the lid on this, I want to take a look at the large connector on the back and the scan head at the front. So let's look at those. So this is the rear of the laser. There's a couple of LEDs mounted on the back here. There's one that says laser, and I assume that's laser emission, and the other one says power. And then there's this very large connector manufactured by Harting. It's a really sort of odd setup. It looks like it's, you know, industrial rated, and you can clip it open, and there's the inside of the connector. So we've got some obvious uh, high current connectors in the middle there, and then some other pins on the outside, presumably for auxiliary stuff, you know, things like interlocks, and uh, presumably the scan head as well. Um, are going to all be fed through there. Very cool. Looks like a very, very expensive connector indeed. So this is a close-up of the scan head of the laser and this was the reason why I bought the thing. Uh, you know, it's like I say, it was for parts and the optics were really, really quite interesting. Got a very, very large lens on here that's uh, got 120 millimeter focal length. It's kind of yellowish or greenish in color and my suspicion is it's zinc selenide. It's probably quite an expensive optic indeed. There's a little connector on the side here, presumably for some kind of shield gas, so maybe argon or dry nitrogen or something, and you feed a gas in at a reasonable pressure and it, it blows across the surface of the lens and, and essentially blows gas out this way. And the idea is it stops smoke and dust and detritus getting onto the surface of the lens and uh, where it can do damage. I mean, obviously, if you've got a 20 watt laser shining at dust on the surface of a lens, it's going to, it's going to burn it and then burn the lens. The lens unscrews. So we'll just carefully get that out of there and see if we can get a view of the scan mirrors. There we go. So that's, that's the lens. Like I say, probably a very, very expensive optic. So definitely worth having, you know, especially if, you know, at some point I intend to do some CO2 laser projects anyway. And so um, a lens like this is going to come in very, very handy, I'm sure. It's probably, probably worth the money I paid just for the lens, right? It looks in good condition as well. There don't appear to be any burns or scratches or anything on it. Very nice. So I've got the laser tilted on its side so we can see right into the scanning assembly and we can see we've got two galvos with what appear to be silicon mirrors. Um, again, probably very, very expensive pieces of kit. I mean, galvos themselves are extraordinarily expensive. Even, even if you buy the inexpensive ones from China, they're still quite expensive. But I'm sure that these are very, very high end. You know, if you're precision engraving barcodes or date codes or whatever, you're going to want some very, very high end galvos. Absolutely fantastic. They'll come in very, very handy for sure. So I've just gotten more bolts off of the scan head here. And there's plenty of them. This thing is a bit tough. It is on there. Again, you know, all of this stuff is stainless steel. And there's something in there. It looks like we've got a board. Or two. So here's the end view of those boards and they're mounted very, very close to the galvos. And my suspicion is, is that these are the final amplifiers or driver stages for the galvos themselves. I was thinking about taking this thing apart. It looks like everything on bolts from the other side of the head, but I really don't want to damage anything because if the scanner head assembly actually still works and there's a good chance it might, um, I've got plans for this in a future project. It would be kind of nice to have a high speed laser engraver of some description. You know, I could always pick up a, a CO2 laser tube off of, uh, off of eBay and see if we can do something interesting with this scan head. That would be very, very cool if we could do like really, really, really high speed engraving of stuff. So I've got all the bolts out of the cover here. So let's lift it and see what we've got.
So on the inside of the cover there, I've got four nice 24 volt fans that will come in handy for something. Let's just stick this to one side. Now that we've got the cover off, we can see what's in here. Um, we've got something with some writing on top. This looks suspiciously like the CO2 laser itself. Um, it says 15 watts at 9.3 microns and there's some serial numbers and some date codes, uh, 170609, so this is quite old. Um, like I say, I don't think there's very much chance of powering this thing up. This looks suspiciously like a Sinrad CO2 laser to me. Excellent. We should be able to get some data sheets on that. So I'm just focused in on the back of the laser head here. There's a DB9 connector going into the laser head itself, which is probably things like interlocks and whatnot, but I'll go and find the manual for this and work it out once we get the thing out. Um, we've got a circuit board here with a couple of LM339 look like comparators on here, and it looks like from the cabling that this is probably going all the way to the front of the head to the scan assembly. Uh, very, very cool. There's a BNC connector on the back of the laser head as well. I'd be interested to see what that is. And there's a couple of couple of thick conductors at the back, uh, red and black, which are probably also for the laser head as well. So I think what to do at this stage is to pull everything out and see if we can actually extract the laser head itself and take a closer look at that. So I've finally gotten all the bolts out of this thing and the fixings off and all the rest of it and what an absolute job that was. Let's all now lift out the tube. So there's our laser and it is indeed manufactured by Sinrad and we've got a model number which means we'll probably be able to figure out what all the connections are supposed to do. Tested at 30 volts, manufactured June 03, 2009. So I'd be interested, like I say, I don't think that there's any chance of uh, powering this thing up. I think it's long dead otherwise, why would they throw it out? But interesting nonetheless, we could have a bit of a tear down on that I suppose. As for the rest of the assembly here, I've got the scan head unbolted. Everything's held together with pegs, so we'll just pop that off. And interestingly, bolted to the front of the laser tube is this thing. Again, it's pegs once you've done the, undone the bolts. But it looks like we've got a possibly a collimating lens assembly. Absolutely fantastic. I mean, like the expense that must have gone into this. I mean, this is this is machined out of a, a you know CNC machined out of a solid piece of aluminium, and then you've got the lens mounted in there as well. That's bound to be of some value, and it looks to be in good condition. There's no there's no burn marks or any discoloration on the surface of the lens. It looks pristine, you know, just like it came out of the factory. Absolutely fantastic. So before we get to the laser itself, I actually found this small board. This was actually wired in parallel with the laser itself. This actually turns out to be a crowbar circuit. So if we exceed 30 volts by a fair margin, you know, 31 volts, 32 volts, this actually clamps straight across the power supply and presumably shorts it out, blows a fuse or whatever. Um, but yeah, that's just a little interesting aside. If we take a look at the top of the laser itself, we've got the usual warning signs over the left hand side there um, and it actually alludes to what is in here. It says it's an RF excited laser, it says it's got to be um, provided with a pre-ionizing tickle signal uh, during standby or laser low periods. Yeah, cool. We'll swing this around and take a look at the business end. So there's the output coupler, that's where the laser beam would emerge from. And if we swing it around the other way, we can see the usual stuff on the back. So we've got a power lamp, we've got a laser light that comes on when the thing is lasing, we've got a little fuse, uh, the power connectors, and then we've got our control signal in. Um, this expects um, a PWM signal in order to run the laser. So it's uh, five kilohertz. And when you're applying the tickle pulse to it, it's five kilohertz with a one microsecond wide pulse. So that's sort of the laser idling as it were. And as you turn up the duty cycle, uh, eventually it'll get to a point where it actually lazies properly and would cut things. On the side there we've got the uh, DB9 connector. This actually just turns out to be interlocks and power signals and stuff. And I've actually wired it up according to the manual uh, to see if we can get some life out of this thing. Anyway, let's uh, power this thing up. As I've said before, the chances are very, very slim that this will work. Uh, these don't age very, very well after about uh, four years of sitting on the shelf. Apparently you've got to refill them with gas, but we'll give it a go anyway. So I have the laser set up on the optical bench here and as a precaution I've mounted a graphite beam block in front of the output coupler. I'm also wearing the all-important laser safety glasses. 
I'm currently feeding it 30 volts, but it's only drawing about 100 milliamps, which is kind of suspiciously low, so I haven't really got much hope, um, but we shall see. Um, I'm also feeding it the all-important PWM signal, so I'm feeding it the tickle pulse, which is a one microsecond wide five kilohertz signal. We'll, uh, we'll give it a quick test. I mean, I can put some paper in front of the beam, but I've done this already and you know, there's nothing, nothing as our output. We wouldn't expect to see anything on camera, but if this thing was running, we'd be able to see at least some light escaping from the end of the bore, but I'm seeing nothing at all. But we'll turn it up anyway. I'll jack it up to 50%. So, So we're at a 50% duty cycle now and um, again, you know, the current draw is kind of suspiciously low. I'm only pulling 300 milliamps out of the supply. And at this stage, I would have expected this piece of paper to be on fire and nothing's happening at all. You know, there's not even a glow from the output coupler. Um, yeah, yeah, so it's, it's obviously most definitely dead. I think at this stage, what we'll do is we'll pop the cover off and investigate whether or not the RF section is even working. So I have the top of the laser head off here and we can see all the electronics inside. At the back we've got a control board with what looks like a PIC microcontroller, probably a couple of regulators for the 5 volt side. And on the left we've got the RF generator itself. Um, everything looks okay, there's no scorch marks or burn marks or anything like that, but let's get a close up of these things. So here's a close up of the control electronics, we've got a little PIC microcontroller on there with a label on the top, that'll mean something to Sinrad no doubt. We've got the power connector, a couple of large capacitors, and probably voltage regulators bolted to the case there. That's pretty much all there is to it. Um, let's scooch over and have a look at the RF section. So this is the RF section itself, and this is what's responsible for driving the tube. As I've said before, this is an RF excited tube. Uh, there's no high voltages in here. I don't, well, you know, maybe 60 volts or something, you know, possibly 100, who knows, um, that's been driven into the tube there by means of the pin. Uh, we've got our... Um, high frequency switching transistor there. This is an MPF 150. Uh, I think that's a 150 megahertz RF transistor. Um, little tune circuit down here. There's a little um, tunable capacitor. We've got silver mica capacitors. Yeah. So what we'll do here is we'll probe this thing. I've got my oscilloscope probe here and I've just connected the ground lead to the tip so that we get a sort of little loop antenna. Let's see if there's actually any RF coming out of this. So the laser's powered up and I'm providing our one microsecond wide five kilohertz tickle pulse. If I take my uh, looped probe and just hold it over the RF output on the laser, we can see a burst of RF there. And if I turn it up to 50% uh, duty cycle, we'll see that RF expand. So unfortunately, it means that the tube itself is dead and in need of a regas, which is, you know, kind of sad, but it was not unexpected, you know. So I've extracted the laser tube from the housing and as we can see it's an all metal construction which is really quite peculiar. If we compare it with a helium neon laser tube for example these are all glass to stand off the high voltage and at one end we've got the anode and then at the other end we've got the cathode. If we swing this around a little bit we can see the rear mirror mount which you couldn't see before and at the front we've got the business end. On top we've actually got an RF connection which doubles up as a fill port as well so when you come to refill these things you unscrew it and fill it with the required gases. These are essentially soft sealed tubes so the fill port has a Viton seal, a Viton O-ring and at the rear there for the mirror mount and at the front for the output coupler they've also got O-rings. So there's every possibility that helium has perhaps leaked out of the tube over time and caused it to fail. The all metal construction of this RF laser tube is actually really quite fascinating, so I'll link in Sinrad's patent down below. So I really wasn't ready to give up on the laser just yet, before I start tearing things down and stripping mirror mounts out and all the rest of the things I had planned for the tube, um, I thought I would give a helium soak a go. And the idea is that where you have a laser tube that's soft sealed like this and a large proportion of the fill gas is helium, um, what you can do to try and rejuvenate these things is to take the tube, stick it in a garbage bag and fill it full of helium and leave it for a few days. And the idea behind this is that helium will soak back in through the seals and into the tube and then you know change the characteristics of the tube such 
that it might fire up. This sounds really, really rough, um, but I'll link in an article down below from Sam's laser fact about that. It's, it's a real thing. Um, when I put the tube back into the laser and find it back up, suddenly instead of drawing 100 milliamps, it's drawing 260. So something's definitely changed, although as we'll see shortly, I am not convinced at all that it was the helium that made any difference. Um, but we've got the thing powered up. In front of the laser, I have a homemade ceramic target now we can't expect that the camera will see 9.3 micron light i mean at that wavelength light is hardly even light anymore it's sort of a beam of heat um, but what we will see because this target is uh, ceramic we will expect to see a little incandescent spot in the middle of the target so let's crank this up to about 75 percent um, duty cycle And excellent, we can see the glow in the middle of the target there. So it's actually heating the target up to the point where it's emitting light. Absolutely fantastic. I've got a little Q-tip here. Let's do the usual smoke test. As we put the Q-tip in the beam, oh, we got fire there. Excellent. Um, yeah, we're happily singeing the Q-tip away. Really, really nice. Um, I have a bit of paper on the desk. Let's see some more fire. Absolutely fantastic. So the big question is with this, well, what is it that's causing the fault? Um, initially, I'd thought that it was the tube that had failed because when we scoped everything, we were, we were seeing RF as we should have done. Uh, we had a correct, uh, something that looked like a reasonable drive signal uh, going to the RF section. Everything looked fine. Um, you know, what was the problem? Now, when I, when I did the helium soak and put the tube back in, of course, I almost fell into the trap of thinking, aha, well, it was the helium that did it. Um, but then, you know, if you, if you think about things rationally, uh, you also need to consider well what changed uh, the things that changed were I removed the entire tube from the assembly um, when I did the helium soak and when I replaced the tube I forgot to replace the RF connector and when I powered it up it was only powered up for you know a, a half a second or so um, it was actually drawing about 400 odd milliamps and I thought oops turned the power off plugged it back in and it was at that point that the thing started working again. Um, incidentally, this thing runs nice as you like for a good few days. You know, I've, I've, I've been waiting now for over a week for it to fail again. And uh, today it's failed once again. And lo and behold, if you unplug the RF connector, power it up for just a fraction of a second, power it back off again, plug it back in, everything starts running. So there's something peculiar going on with the oscillator. I'm not entirely sure what it is. Um, I don't know, maybe there's oddness going on with the drive section, but I certainly haven't seen anything really telling on the oscilloscope. Uh, there's a slight difference in the way the square wave that, uh, that drives the, you know, switches the oscillator on and off appears when it's in its fault condition, um, but I'm yet to try and nail this down. Um, I don't know, maybe, they, maybe it needs tuned a little bit. There's a, a little variable capacitor down there to tune the oscillator to the laser tube's resonant frequency. Um, maybe the tuning's slightly off, who knows? Uh, but I'll certainly be investigating this and figuring out what's going on. But the good news is the tube's good. The oscillator works most of the time. Uh, the drive circuit seems to work most of the time. So whatever it is, I've got one of those evil intermittent faults that I've got to chase down in here. But, you know, um, I have a working 9.3 micron CO2 laser. So what's not to like? Since the laser is in serviceable condition, um, it's time to actually you know, spend a bit of time uh, tidying this thing up. So originally it had a, an OEM end plate that mounts the rest of the uh, scan head assembly. So it is a bit scabby, so I've replaced it with my own uh, aluminium end plate, which is more like Sinrad's original design. It's just a piece of aluminium uh, with a nice big hole in. I'll have to get a, a laser aperture warning label for down here. Uh, but yeah, excellent. It looks really, really nice. I've also, because it's OEM equipment, ordered a key switch. Um, so that will be getting installed in the back of the unit. There's actually a hole for it. Um, because it's OEM, the cables come out of that hole, but I'll route them down the side out of the, the, the hole that they're supposed to be routed out of and replace it with a key switch. Um, in a future project, um, there's a slot up the top here for a mechanical shutter. Um, so I suppose it would be a very good idea to actually, you know, given this is a class four laser, putting out several watts of, uh, watts of power, um, I ought to build a shutter in. So that'll be a future project as well, but very, very nice. So I spent a bit of time looking into this scan head uh, to try and figure out how are we supposed to drive this. And initially I thought that perhaps um, there was some kind of digital signal that we feed in to control the galvos. After a little bit of research on the internet, it turns out that the most likely protocol for this is one called XY2100, um, which is supposed to be an industry standard, but 
the amount of information that is available on the internet you could literally stick on the head of a match it's it's like unbelievably thin on the ground and um, fortunately there's a couple of users on github who have successfully reverse engineered the um, xy2 100 protocol and for a quick test i'm actually using um, a user's library called 2a or 2et um, who's on GitHub. He's released an XY2 100 library for the Teensy 3.2, um, which I've actually got connected up here. Um, currently, I'm feeding in a, a small diode laser to test this thing. Obviously, we don't want to stick this in front of a CO2 laser when we're doing tests like this, uh, because who knows what terrible things could go wrong. Um, but we'll give it a quick test. So I'll just power up the Teensy. And I've currently got a little sketch on here that draws an expanding square. So it is indeed XY2100 and it seems that the whole scan head is working just fine. So we've got a fantastic little pattern going on there. Great. Um, all we really need now is a, is a proper program to run this stuff. Um, and I found another library called OpenGalvo or Opal and I'll link in both of these down below. I'm not going to cover these libraries on this particular video right now because I suspect the video has dragged on long enough as it is. But definitely a future project is to get this scanner set up um, and actually doing something useful like engraving or something. Since I've been spending a little bit of time with the library I've done you know quite a few tests. One of them is to print little random circles like this. And another one here that just does a static square as a test just to see that linearity is good. Um, but yeah, it's looking, uh, it's looking pretty reasonable. Um, excellent. So I've got a working CO2 laser, a working scanner and, and some other bits and pieces as well. So with a little repair work, this has turned out to be an excellent auction score. I've got a, a CO2 laser scanner um, with the F-theta lens and silicon mirrors and all the rest of the stuff in there and it's in good serviceable working condition. I've got a 15 watt 9.3 micron CO2 laser which also works and I've even got the collimating lens for it as well. Um, I never mentioned much about this earlier on in the video but I've gone and looked this up on Edmund Optics and uh, the purpose of this lens is to expand the beam a little bit and reduce the divergence. So the divergence of CO2 lasers is really quite large, it's like two or three millirads so um, you need something to uh, provide a more tightly collimated beam. Um, when I was looking on Edmund um, at this stuff, you'd be looking to pay like eight or nine hundred dollars for this lens alone. So this is a really, really fantastic score. When you factor in uh, all of the stuff that I managed to strip out of this domino laser head, absolutely brilliant. Thanks for watching this episode of Leslie's Lab. If you want to see more teardowns and projects like this, don't forget to hit like and subscribe down below, and I'll see you guys next time.